There's nothing dangerous about eating meat. There's nothing dangerous about having vegetable and seed oils. I'm sorry, it's, it's not dangerous. Dr. Eric Westman. He is an obesity medical specialist. And New York Times best-selling author. He can help anyone lose weight and transform their health. Two of my patients lost over 50 pounds without me doing anything. And one of the patients looked at me and said, all I did is eat steak and eggs. People were telling me, oh, you're gonna kill people. You can't do that. You can't eat fat. You can actually have people lose weight just eating at McDonald's and reversing diabetes. I think that's gonna be very controversial. Yeah, if you have all of the time and energy in the world, you can be focused and you can be perfect. But no, in my, in my clinic, in my world, we say progress, not perfection. I have a McDonald's burger sometimes and I just eat the meat. Carnivore can actually be easier for some people. If eating saturated fat raises your HDL cholesterol, you want more cholesterol. Especially if you have type 2 diabetes, it is, it is so much more of a risk factor for the heart disease and stroke. So there are dangers of doing diets like this and that's if you're on medicines so that the medicines become too strong. As I transition someone from a high carb to a low carb diet, if you do have ketosis, you might get a gout flare. So I have a long list of questions here talking about the dangers of a carnivore diet. Are you ready for the first one? Yeah. You don't get enough vitamin C from eating meat and therefore you're gonna get scurvy. <laughs> well, there are some concerns on a carnivore diet and a lot of conflicting information. And that's why today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Eric Westman. He is an internal obesity medicine specialist, and he'll give you the unbiased answers to all these concerns and dangers of just following a meat only diet. Now, if you enjoy this interview, please feel free to hit that subscribe button. Dr. Westman, you have spent the last 25 years researching the best diet. How did all this start? <laughs> well, my interest in diet was very practical. It was two patients came to me. I imagine I'm a doctor in a clinic at the VA hospital, Veterans Affairs Hospital. And I was kind of an unusual internal medicine specialist because I was interested in preventing disease and most internists just manage diseases with medications. So two people came to me, two of my patients lost over 50 pounds without me doing anything. And, and I was curious and I asked, what did you do? And, and one of the patients looked at me and said, all I did is eat steak and eggs. And he kind of store, stared me down and I was shocked. And, and, and today you have to understand a lot of doctors will be shocked if you tell them that. So, but for me, my shock was 25 years ago and it, and it piqued my interest. So I, not knowing much about nutrition, like you have to understand most doctors don't get trained in nutrition either. I went out to learn and visited doctors using this low carb method, it turns out. And there was a, the science behind it that uh, was, you know, kind of fledgling at the time. And so it was really out of patient care. I, I thought we would just do a few studies and and gosh, you don't need a doctor to do this. These people did it without me. And, and uh, the, But then there were all these barriers, one after the other, that came through as we did research. So it's so actually, I was curious to see how my patients did it and thought that if we could wrap some science around it, that's what was missing. So we started the research on low-carb diets and keto diets and even carnivore-like diets over uh, 25 years ago. Okay. And what did you see 25 years ago? Well, when, you know, like any good evidence-based medicine doctor, so you have to understand I'm an internal medicine specialist at a major university, Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. And I was in training to learn how to do clinical trials, randomized controlled trials, and learning about the evidence how you, you could make a, a, a case for a drug getting FDA approved, for example, you do certain studies. And when we went to the literature about this steak and egg diet, or I learned that it was called Atkins diet, and there was really nothing in the, the medical literature even to say that it was bad. 
So to my surprise, once I got into this, people were telling me, oh, you're going to kill people. You you can't do that. You can't eat fat and you have to have carbs and all this. But there really wasn't any data to say it was bad. It was all sort of a, a social taboo that was happening. Taboo meaning there's a, a restriction that you can't use it, but there was no evidence to say that it was bad. So to me, that was that was kind of good because it was a, a, a kind of a blank slate. We could start doing research. And I visited doctors who were using this method. I went up to Dr. Atkins office in New York City. He was in practice at the time. And, and I was, you know, a brash young investigator from Duke. And I said, you need to do a study. And I, I must have done a, done a good uh, a, a pitch or sales job because he pulled out his checkbook and wrote out a check for the first study out of his personal funds <laughs> with looking back that's kind of hilarious uh, that uh, but it was the only group that was interested in in studying this so you, you have to understand 25 years ago even the idea of studying this was uh, uh, taboo it was off limits you couldn't study it so we've come a long way in terms of the science and we did that first study and then other studies and now studies have been done pretty much all over the world looking at diets that are very low in carbohydrate and uh, i got to use diets that were high in carbohydrate as well because they were typically our control group we would compare the low carb versus low fat which was the diet of the day remember that now it's kind of faded away and, and the names of things are, are fascinating because what I teach under 20 total grams of carbohydrate today, largely uh, each day, largely vegetables, start, non-starchy vegetables and a little bit of greens is almost a carnivore diet. It's almost a zero carbohydrate diet. And so you get into the language of comparing what people are doing and on. I look at it in terms of how many grams of carbohydrate do you eat per day as a scientific metric uh, to compare different diets? Of course, then you can look at, is it largely vegetarian? Is it largely meatitarian? Is it is it meat sources and uh, and vegetable sources? So then you get it gets all muddled and, and confused. <laughs> but the main thing in terms of fat burning and, and our studies were done at first to look at weight loss, fat loss, because that's what it's so well known for. And that was my beginning. Those two patients lost weight and lost fat weight. To become a real good fat burner or maximal fat burner, you want to keep the carbohydrates super low. So your body looks around and, well, there are no carbs. I'd wait, I, I'll burn the fat then you know, because we all store the fat. In fact, we all become fat burners. We go into nutritional ketosis after two or three days of not eating anything. I mean, that's just our default mode because we store fat on our bodies. So that now 25 years later, what you know, people thought, oh, ketosis will kill you. I'm like, no, this is a natural situation that we all do. In fact, the people who say ketosis kills you will be really happy that their body is able to burn its own fat when they're unable to find food for two or three days. I mean, but, you know, we're in the, such a most of the world is in such a situation where we can't fathom ever being without food. I, I've asked that in audiences, you know, how many of you have gone a day without eating? And it's very rare today in, in modern times. So actually in nutritional ketosis, fat burning is achieved by very low carbohydrates. It's a, a, a can be a healthy way uh, to for therapy reversing diabetes and obesity, but also a healthy way of living if, if you do it right. So I have a long list of questions here from my viewers talking about the dangers of a carnivore diet. But before we get into these, I wanted to ask a personal question. Why are seed oils part of the Atkins diet? Well, I think there's a element of, we call it internet keto in, in my my the people I teach. We, there's an internet keto out there, and then there's the evidence-based keto, which the science studies and studies we've done. We've, we've never limited seed oils or vegetable oils because the amount is so low. 
because you're you're already restricting the the foods that have those things in them and i think the relative importance is minor and and i know that causes a huge furor in fact there are some books and i and i ask questions of the book author who's out there who says all you have to do is get rid of seed oil and vegetable oils and your health will be great no no you have to address the carbohydrates as well and so there's there's even this belief that if you're not following the oil side of things, making your own salad dressing, that this won't work. And that's just simply not true. I've never really told anyone to limit their vegetable oil or seed oils. And and it works just fine because the lowering the carbohydrate is a major factor to get your body to burn its own fat. The The oxidative stress or the inflammation from these other things may be a big deal if you're eating lots of the, the junk foods and, and highly processed foods that are available today. But if you're avoiding all of those things, then it becomes a relatively minor thing. I, I, I don't, I'm not part of the Atkins company or the, or the products that I um, uh, was, uh, I knew Dr. Atkins and, and Mrs. Atkins, and then they sold the company and it got into other, other um, realms. Like um, now they have products out there that, that are high in carbs that I asked my patients not to have actually some are okay some aren't and uh but uh i don't i I would i think that's probably it that it's a relatively minor thing okay i think that's going to be very controversial with my audience watching i'd love to know do you think that seed oils or vegetable oils are a controversial thing uh because it's very much in the carnival community oh the seed oils carbohydrates yes but the seed oils the seed oils like that's nasty it's like every time i post on twitter um the number of likes and views or anything that talks about seed oils and sugar is just exponential well that's uh let me just spend a minute just on language and and you know danger you know please you know when i when i see a nutritionist or a dietitian or a doctor saying something's dangerous i mean to me that means you're on the edge of a cliff right or, or you're, you're you're about ready to fall yeah there's a gun at your head or there, there, that's danger right you know so so there's nothing dangerous about eating meat I mean, there's nothing dangerous about having vegetable and seed oils. I mean, I'm sorry, it's it's not dangerous. Is it harmful? Well, okay. So now let's get into the language. Can it possibly? Okay, you're not you're not falling off a cliff here. But is it dangerous? Uh, no. Is it harmful over you know a day? No, absolutely not. I mean, is it harmful over a year? Uh, I don't think so. You know. So anyway, we're getting to to shading here of of the, the real information that we have. However, when you're teaching somebody in the, in the reality, in the clinic, and I do that for four weekdays uh, a week still here in Durham at Duke University, often in the initial teaching, people will feel like it's da- poison or in order to keep them away from it. So it's like, you know, don't put your finger in the light socket, you know, you, you, you know, for heaven's sake, it's dangerous. You know, well, I don't know. I've never put my finger. You can't put your finger in there because it, anyway. So uh, sometimes people will need that sort of danger for for an initial uh, starting of a program because you're staying away from all these foods that you used to have, and sugar can be highly addictive for some people. So you want to just stay away. In fact, if if I didn't have artificial sweeteners for for my patient population here in North Carolina, the, you know, the average bear, average person, if I didn't have some other form of sweetener other than sugar, this diet program, this approach wouldn't work because the tug towards something sweet is so strong at first for so many people. Now, that's not to say that you need to have these non-sugar sweeteners or, or, and I, I put them kind of in that same category as vegetable oils and seed oils, because you know, show me a paper in real humans, intact humans. This is my world of clinical research where we deal with people, not mice, not, you know, not, not even baboons. I would show me a paper with seed oil actually causing a problem in a prospective study, prospective manner. It doesn't exist. 
So the, we have a lot of studies of nutritional epidemiology where you're, you're asking people what they eat and you get associations and association is not causation. And, and hopefully uh, those of you who are really worried about these sort of things have learned a little bit about the level of evidence that we have, the science. Uh, you have to vet that information yourself. The, the, sadly, the media doesn't do a good job of filtering out the bad information. The, the, the association, not causation, is you know, really the basis for the seed oil issue, the, the, the red meat causing cancer issue. I mean, these are not solid sources of information. So I guess the whole point that Dr. Westman is trying to say is what's called compliance and adherence. And Dr. Goldcamp was another doctor I spoke to two weeks ago, which talks about, you know, ketogenic diets and even the carnivore diet. The biggest problem is people sticking to the diet. So if you can get the big culprit out of the way, which is the carbohydrates and the sugar and work on eating more meats, maybe if you want to choose to eat a little bit of vegetables. And I guess if those seed oils are in there, that's okay. You don't have to be perfect. It's not going to make you, as you said, go off the cliff. Does that summarize that well? Yes. Yeah. And I think it worry about all of these different things makes it harder to adhere to. So that I, I've had people come to me not knowing the relative importance of these things. So that uh, one person might say, well, I couldn't go to the farmer's market that week to get the this super clean uh, grass-fed beef that's, you know, raised 10 miles from here. So I went to McDonald's and had a burger with the bun. You know, that no, that's not the, re the relative <laughs> importance is, you know, don't eat the bun and have the burger at McDonald's. And I know that's going to cause a furor. But again, I have to meet people where they are. In Durham, North Carolina, most people will eat fast food sometime, you know, and the chicken. I mean, there's a three line, three lane drive through at our local chicken for, for the lunchtime where they drive through it and <laughs> people are lined up around the block. And, and so, okay, get the grilled chicken. Well, they use seed oil. I don't stress about that. You know, if you're, if you're living a busy life and all, so yeah, if you have all the time and energy in the world, you can be focused and you can be perfect, but no, in my, in my clinic, in my world, we say, progress, not perfection, and focus on the, the carbs as the main thing, keeping those super low. Absolutely. I actually said it in another interview with Lisa Duncan around, I have a McDonald's burger sometimes and I just eat the meat. And there were some comments around like, oh, that is terrible meat. It's not real meat. And I'm just like, well, you know, I have it once in a while. I don't think it's a big deal. So it's just, you know, you can't please everybody. But again, the biggest thing with any diet per se is compliance and adherence. So anything that you can do to stick to it, that's the big thing that is a big challenge. Along that, that theme, the, the way you learn it is really important in how sustainable it is. So if you learn in the way I teach it, it I, I teach total flexibility. You know, I give a, a list of foods and, and yes, meat, poultry, fish and shellfish and eggs would be the, the protein section. And there's a little bit of cheese and and you know if now i'm learning now with carnivore they're you know well you know wolves don't have coffee so you can't have coffee i'm like wait a minute wait a minute time out so to what degree are you practicing something like that i, I i'm not into that world so deeply but but so a little bit of vegetables to me i don't enforce that anymore so that so i came to this learning a method where you had proteins you had a limited amount of cheese, and that that trips up a lot of people. Uh, and uh, but the idea that you could eat from a list anything you want opens up a lot of flexibility. The idea that you don't have to stress so much about super clean eating, and and that you don't have to have medium chain triglyceride oils and bulletproof coffee. I mean that that's that internet keto teaching that really doesn't have a whole lot of evidence in terms of uh, weight loss or diabetes reversal. All this stuff kind of propped up, uh, but the idea that you can do it simply, and and you don't stress if you're traveling, you're 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 going through an area where there's you know a food desert. I mean, yeah, that's just that's that's silly. That so so it's tripped up the the mainstream researchers is that they 
think you can't have fast food. Well, if you can't have fast food, so they call it a food desert where, you know, there's only a McDonald's. There's no, you know, bougie uh, Whole Foods or Sprouts or some, you know, some Wegman, you know, some new grocery store. So they call it, a, you know, no, you can actually have people lose weight just eating at McDonald's and reversing diabetes and all these other things. It's not a food desert. In fact, there's there are more calories being carried around on people in poverty now worldwide. There's more obesity in poverty than underweight. So it's a problem of malnutrition, meaning too many carbs, not enough protein. And so anyway, I, I like those extremes because I need I need to teach people a method that is sustainable. But so if you if you've learned, you know, you have to have grass fed beef, you have to go to the farmer's market and you have to buy uh, a medium chain of glyceride and apple cider vinegar and avocado oil. It's so expensive. And then this no one's going to be able to do that. I mean, you might be able to, but it gets difficult. And then family comes to town and they give you a hard time. And, I'm, you know, let's make it simple. Focus on the main important things, which is getting protein. You know, we're made of protein. Not, not fruit, you know, not, not carbs. So you need to have some protein and then uh, you don't have to have carbs. And even then it's okay to not eat, which is another fascinating phenomenon. People call it, are you intermittent fasting? Are you, are you, well, if you're not hungry, you shouldn't eat. So it's not another behavioral thing I work on is if you're not hungry, don't eat so much, you know, actually, so people end up spending less. Of course, if you're not buying the super expensive foods because they're eating less. So I explain for weight loss that, well, you're actually eating the food that you ate last year because it's stored on your body as fat. So you're just using that energy that you'd already purchased from the store and now storing on your body. So as a fat burner, most people end up eating once or twice a day. You get to eat great foods, uh, the meat, poultry, fish and shellfish and eggs as the main source of protein, uh, it doesn't have to be hard. And, and it, making it simple makes it more sustainable. Now, if you're moving from a carbohydrate diet to a zero carbohydrate diet, as Dr. Westman is saying, there can be some transitional effects from moving to this kind of lifestyle, especially adaptation and trying to get into ketosis. So what you want to do is to try to increase your sodium. And you can do that through consuming more salt, whether that be in your foods or also in your drinks. But if this is not enough, you can opt for a supplement. And the one that I absolutely love is Element because Element contains the right amount of sodium, potassium, and magnesium. And this doesn't contain any additives. There is no nasties, there's no added sugars. So it's gonna make sure that you get the best carnivore or keto results. And the one that I always use, I use this raw unflavored option because it just helps my lifestyle. I don't tolerate sweeteners that much. I put this in my fatty latte every morning and I put this in my water bottle every single day. It is so easy. So right now, Element is offering this free sample pack on every order. So you're gonna get eight single servings of Element to try it for free. So if you want this, all you have to do is go to drinkelement.com forward slash five minute body. That's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com forward slash five minute body to get this wonderful free sample pack. Let's just get back to the episode. So making it simple, making it more sustainable, um, you teach a keto-based way and also a carnival-based way. So it's a mixture. I'm curious to know for people that try keto, their carbohydrates are even like under 20, but there's still some carbohydrates coming from vegetables. Why does that not work for people? Why would they have to go to carnival? Well, I've seen it in a couple, couple ways. One, probably the most compelling argument is some medical problems go away when you when you take away that final, even though it's not much, so, so that final little vegetable source of, of uh, and and no one really understands yet why you know it it could be the leaky gut, it could be the nightshade vegetables, it could be the you know all these different. To me, the mechanism isn't so important, but if you're if you're uh, struggling with a medical issue. And you're the 
20 gram or less you're having vegetables isn't working to fix that you might go to a carnivore level and and um, i think that in my experience and in my practice i i allow that and i support that for medical reversal medical disease reversal that the next thing is adherence some people just find it easier simpler you don't have to worry about other it, you know so <laughs> carnivore can actually be easier for some people because you're not having to worry about which vegetable which you know how many carbs are in that one uh so um because most carnivore sources of food have no carbs or a trivial amount of carbs you don't have to worry about how much you're eating the body can meter that in fact you can lose weight and start burning your own body fat because the carbs are really low. And uh, there's um, a lot of, this gets into the language again, not all people eating carnivore have measurable ketones. So people say, well, it's not a keto diet. Well, some people on a keto diet don't have measurable ketones. So I'm not, so I'm not, so remember danger or, or keto or carnivore, no, don't worry about those charged words. The, the idea that you're eating great sources of protein and, and you're burning your body fat, this is a healthy thing to do. And I uh, think the sustainability, again, if you, if you like eating these foods, I've met some people who just they eat a rib ribeye every day and they're happy. I, I meet some pe I meet some people who if they don't have something new every day they're not happy. You know, so that again is a style for an individual. And and the, it's so funny how people project. Uh, doctors do that too. You know, well I couldn't do that keto diet, so no one could do it. You know, it's like that, and that's what a lot of doctors are saying now. It's well, it's not sustainable. And and I just fire back. I say yes, it is. And they go, what? It's what? Show me. Prove to Why do you say it's not sustainable? Because you can't do it? <laughs> because, because you haven't tried? That's usually the reason. But in the clinical trials that have been done comparing all sorts of different diets, a low-carb or, or a carnivore-ish diet is as easy to follow. The adherence is, compliance is, is the same or better than other types of diets. So, you know, to each his own, you know, his or her own. Uh, if you like eating this way, it reverses a medical issue. Um, there, there's a, it's not danger. I don't know. So when you ask me what are the dangers of a carnivore diet, I don't know of any. Well, I have some. <laughs> so that's interesting because you said that some doctors poo-poo a carnivore diet and they talk about all of these dangers. And the dangers that we're going to talk about now, there's 10 of them. They're actually, you would say, that makes sense because it does happen on a carnivore diet. So I wanted to get your perspective now on these 10 true dangers of, of a carnivore diet. But these are the main things that I hear. So are you ready for the first one? Yeah. Meat doesn't give you all the essential nutrients you need, like polyphenols, potassium, and magnesium. That's not true. Meat, if you're eating nose to tail, even then there's some vocal carnivore proponents out there who say they haven't eaten meat to tail or nose to tail. They just eat the muscle of the animal. They're fine. I think most experts will say, looking at the daily intake, if you eat the nose to tail, you, know, you get all of the nutrients that you need. The, that polyphenol or, or idea that there's something in the plants that's extra special, well, that, that you can live without those things. And, you know, until there are studies that show whether some people have those things and not going forward in time. Again, we're to talking association, not causation. I mean, I guess you could say, well, there's resveratrol in, in red wine. So you could have wine with your steak and not have to worry about having the vegetable. I mean, so uh, those are not essential nutrients that are in these vegetables. Those are things that you might, people add in to say that it's healthier for you, but I, I don't really buy into that. Uh, there, there's a phenomenon where people want to, most people want to take something to get better. You know, some sort of nostrum, some some vitamin or something. When you're really getting that nutrition from the animal sources of food. And I asked 
Amber O'Hearn, who writes about carnivore diets to review the nutrient profile if someone was doing true carnivore. And basically, you know, acknowledging that there are no clinical trials, large clinical trials of people going forward, the nutrient base is solid. So you don't have to have vegetable matter. I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that. What about the potassium? Because people always say that potassium, oh, you have to have like banana. You have to have fruit to get, you know, potassium. No, no, you know, uh, I'm going to backpedal if you're not going to ask. that. So there are dangers of doing diets like this, and that's if you're on medicines, so that the medicines become too strong. So the only time I've seen a problem with potassium is when someone's on a diuretic or medicine that makes you lose the potassium, cause potassium wasting. And so many people in a clinical setting are on all of these medicines. I mean, doctors hand them out like candy. So the uh, I joke that the only thing cardiologists know or other doctors know about nutrition is that a banana has potassium in it. And so they're, they're and, it, and it's a milli equivalent per inch. I mean, so this is kind of in the medical, but there are other ways to get potassium without bananas. That uh, And then GI doctors, all they know is you should have more fiber when there's never been a prospective randomized trial showing that fiber does any good for you. So I don't worry about the potassium. Now, uh, you do want to have salt and sodium becomes a possible issue if someone is feeling weak or and, and you do want to have sodium probably more than you're you, accustomed to. To having so if you crave salt have salt some people will those who are selling these electrolyte supplements will say you need them and, and i am I, I usually wait for a symptom if someone is low on sodium then take sodium but you could just take a salt supplement there are a lot of different types out there and some of them have sodium potassium magnesium so you don't have to worry about any of those things but i don't worry if you're eating foods, you're, you're, you don't have medical issues on medications, you're going to get all the potassium that you need. Okay. The next one is kind of tied to the first one. Um, you don't get enough vitamin C from eating meat and therefore you're going to get scurvy. <laughs> well, the enough of a nutrient is fascinating when you, when you think about how that is developed and it's uh, usually looking at extreme cases where the nutrient was so low that there's some problem like scurvy. So that's a vitamin C deficiency. You get bleeding gums and, and uh, it really hasn't been an issue since I think sailors were, you know, out on, on the water without limes and lemons. And so they, the uh, idea of scurvy being a problem is, is a different issue than having a lower amount of vitamin C. And so the, nobody's getting scurvy on low carb, you know, carnivore diets. So if it's a lower amount of vitamin C, it's argued that you need less vitamin C when you're not eating sugar, not eating carbohydrates. Another way to come at this is, uh, I, I went to a meeting in Ottawa some years ago where one of the, uh, Canadian dietitians got up. It was a, a conference on the first nations diet and, and diabetes. And the uh, person got up arguing that, yes, there is vitamin C in the meat and in the skin. And, and no, the Inuit never had any scurvy, but we still want you to eat eight to 12 servings of, you know, fruits and vegetables and, you know, and follow the food guide pyramid that because the Canadians adopted the U.S. one, which is a you know, total disaster. So, so in, a, in a scientific meeting, this person toggled into the political uh, position of you have to follow the, a guideline when this, she said the science was that the, the vitamin C is not a concern. People do say that if you eat organs, then that provides more vitamin C like liver. Is that right? Yeah, well, so uh, I follow a, a writer and a scientist who writes in this area, Zoe Harcum. Uh, Har she's in the UK, and she has some great essays and and go does deep dives into all of this. and And liver is out, you know, far and away the most nutritious 
in a food. And, you know, she lines up, you know, even comparing to any carb containing food, liver is, is fantastic. So if I'm to hedge the bet on what we know and what we don't know, I do think it's good to have Oregon meats if you're going to be following a carnivore diet. Uh, and that could be in sausages and yes, hot dogs, God forbid, it, it's okay, <laughs> you know, but the uh, idea, you know, a uh, uh, bratwurst and all that, you want that sort of organ meat. Do you have to send out away for freeze-dried liver? No, I don't think so. Do you need to, you know, get, uh, uh, um, if you want to do that, great. But my approach is to make things simple, affordable, and I don't uh, push liver on folks. It, it's fascinating. And uh, when I was growing up, I remember having liver and onions and, in the Midwestern United States, and now it's like nobody eats liver, and or it's kind of making a comeback, but you don't see it very often in in the typical restaurants. But uh, if you like it, go for it. Okay, next one is red meat increases your cholesterol. No, not necessarily. And the issue of cholesterol is fascinating. You know, there's a, a good one and a bad one, even in the old paradigm of looking at cholesterol. So. If eating saturated fat raises your HDL cholesterol, you want more cholesterol. So, so if someone is using that kind of language, they're not really showing the nuance of it. it. And it really kind of depends on whatever else you're eating for the day. I've had people with high cholesterol have lower cholesterol after eating red meat in the context of a carnivore or low-carb keto kind of diet. And uh, most people, my estimate is about two thirds of people will have a reduction in the cholesterol across the board. It, it, you know, the total, the LDL, the triglyceride, the HDL all change in the way you want. About a third of people don't have that improvement or lowering of LDL that every doctor wants to, to see. And yet the triglyceride goes down and the HDL go up. So we look at the cholesterol pattern in a different way. But I have no concern about what red meat consumption does on the cholesterol profile, although I know other, other doctors do. So you mentioned LDL, and so that one is the bad cholesterol, right, that we talk about? Well, that's the traditional teaching. I, I call it the old paradigm. It, it's the, you know, it's like using the phone with a cord. Well, or maybe touch tone. Well, yeah, touch tone phones had cords. Well, yeah, they all did. So that's when the LDL idea came about, when we were all using phones with cords. So it's been around a long time. It's spawned a whole uh, uh, cadre of medications and, and a whole field of medical care today looks at a cholesterol level and treats it with a drug. So I, I've fallen out of that world. I'm using a smartphone. Now I can actually take pictures with my phone. I, it has no cord. How could, can you imagine that? So, so in the cholesterol itself, we lower triglyceride levels on a low carb diet and we raise HDL, good cholesterol levels in the old paradigm, if you want to call it that. And it's just a different way of going about it. So if someone has uh, red meat consumption, the total and the LDL go up, but the HDL went up and the triglyceride went down and in the context of whatever else is going on, especially if you have type 2 diabetes, you don't want a doctor to, to get unfocused and, and try to uh, obsess about a cholesterol level. You want to reverse the type 2 diabetes. It is, it is so much more of a risk factor for the atherosclerosis, the heart disease and stroke. So many doctors today are, are kind of uh, not assessing the, the risk of things well. They're, they might be following a guideline to give you a, a drug for diabetes to manage it, not reverse it, and a drug for the cholesterol to manage it, not reverse it. And the doctors who are using carnivore diets and low-carb diets uh, chronicled in a book by Gary Taubes called The Case for Keto. He interviews 100, 100 doctors who are using this now. Um, we take advantage of 
the carnivore diet to reverse diabetes. And, and that's just, you know, not on the radar of most endocrinologists, even, even university trained endocrinologists are, are searching for the medication when another approach, the reversal of it is actually using lifestyle. And, and, you know, who knew that it could be as simple as just eating meat? And that's the other thing. It, it can't be that simple. How could it? Yeah, it can. So uh, years ago, I said, it's so unbelievable, you won't believe it. And, and uh, some people uh, kept uh, kind of pushing that sort of idea. Yeah, it's so unbelievable. Doctors and even the patient in front of me, I have to explain that, uh, yes, all of this can happen. And it's almost like I have to undersell what can happen because then people think I'm just a total quack because you know everything basically gets better with you know with time uh and and you have to be careful in a, a world where there are a lot of charlatans there are a lot of people selling a product that uh you know so adding liver onto a diet full of carbohydrate is probably not going to do much but having liver in the context of a red meat full diet i'm not worried about the cholesterol anymore I, i'm using a, a smartphone not a phone with a cord. I love that analogy. And after we talk about the dangers, I wanted to ask you something along the lines with the diabetes because it's targeting the insulin, but we're hearing these different things about having low insulin all the time is not what you want. The next one is some studies show that red meat can increase cardiovascular disease and age you. Yeah, I, I don't think that those studies are solid. That It's weak data. It's correlational data. The uh, best essay or article that, again, recently that I saw was by Zoe Arkham, who yet again tore apart a correlational study from nutritional epidemiology where you ask people what they eat. And, you know, even as a, th that just doesn't make sense, right? You, you ask people what they eat. You didn't even go home and look at what they ate, you know? And, you know, are, are you going to tell someone on a survey that you had, you know, a whole pack of Snickers bars? I mean, you know, so anyway, it just from from the face validity of it, meaning the common sense of it, this, you know, it's going to be fraught with problems. So but even even if you did measure perfectly what people are eating and you follow them over time, it's not a randomized kind of situation where you're eliminating or reducing the bias that would tend to have someone eat red meat. So it turns out those who eat red meat are more likely to be smokers. They're, they're more likely to do other risky behavior, you know, like drive motorcycles and, and you know, uh, uh, the other, that healthy user bias is a big problem. The, uh, so the red meat and, and heart disease, it does get some attention like, um, over the last year or so, there was a meeting abstract where the media pick up from a meeting and put an abstract out there. And it was a, you know, correlational prospective study. It wasn't even clear that the people were eating, you know, low carb diets because the, those people in that study were still eating 30% of their diet from carbohydrate. So, and yet, a doctor who wants to take a pot shot against it or, or maybe just doesn't know will call that a low carbohydrate because it's lower than the 50% that most people eat. So the studies that are out there are not solid um, and they're being used and amplified by groups that have other agendas for wanting you not to eat meat, which are valid. I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm not happy with the, way animals are treated if it's inhumane treatment. And, and so, uh, uh, so you'll find groups like the, the animal rights organizations using the, the data that are really weak, but amplifying that. And, and uh, the other uh, kind of ethical uh, folks, uh, or even religious folks, I mean, the, the, it's the darndest thing that, you know, if you want to be vegetarian, fine. Why, why are you trying to make me, you know, it, it's almost like a proselytization of a religion, you know, trying to convince you to become Christian or, uh, you know, but to become a, so, uh, 
writer to, taught me years ago that, that, you know, religion, food, and politics, these, these are not rational. They, they become very emotional and it, it's hard to, to, you know, sway someone another way. Uh, but so that's why, you know, if someone is vegetarian and, and it's part of their social fabric of who they are for, you know, I, I found that I have to teach healthy vegetarian diets because that's what someone chooses to do. I, so I, I don't push people toward a carnivore or low carb meat based approach as the best answer for everyone. I don't, I don't think we're at that stage, but, but if it's something that in your sphere fixed your unfixable health problems, yeah, you know, that's pretty powerful. And, and you don't need to persuade other people to do it unless, you know, you have, you care about people and although be careful, the un, uh, un, solicited um, advice uh, from relatives, especially with the holidays, uh, it's not always welcome. <laughs> so I, I teach my patients to show and, and demonstrate and, and teach by example so that you will follow, other people will follow you the longer you're doing it, showing the result itself, not just talking about it. You're actually demonstrating it. It's so interesting in my comments. Um, I do look at my comments and I read every one of them. So if you want to comment something, I'm going to see it. Um, so I had a vegetarian actually say, because I said on a previous video that it would be so funny if a vegan or a vegetarian is watching this video because it's kind of, you know, meat-based or carnival-based or keto-based. And a vegetarian said, actually, I'm here to learn. I'm here to actually learn about meat and the carnival way to improve my life. So sometimes it's not just naysayers, but some people actually want to hear the other side of it. They want better health. They don't want the propaganda or the brainwashing that they've previously been heard. Yeah, well, and you know, if um, if there are medical issues that that aren't being fixed, even and I, I say this because one of my patients showed up in a book reversing her issue that I couldn't fix, although you know it had to do with other social issues, but that that last little bit of vegetable matter that she pinched out of her diet it enabled her to reclaim health, have a baby, got married. I mean, it was just kind of a totally dramatic situation in a, in a, a situation where uh, the medical world didn't understand. In fact, she explained in her own book that she wrote uh, that whenever she ate, it hurt. Well, it went, and then, but no one drilled down to the fact that it was really eating the vegetables and the, and the plants that hurt because, you know, who's going to take the time to help you figure that out? Most people will say you have to have your, your plants. And so she ended up, she was on a hospital hospitalized for anorexia. And she wrote in the book, I don't belong here. It, they wanted to give me medicines for my brain when it hurt, when I ate food. And that's why I didn't eat. So she figured it out on, reading someone else's information that just by eating the, the meat that she could eat and regain her weight enough to ha have a pregnancy and, and now it would be a normal life from uh, hospitalization with anorexia and nervosa. I mean, that is a, a, that's a chronic disease, chronic disease that nobody can fix really. But wait, she did it by just changing the food. That, you know, so those kinds of extreme cases have me eyes wide open. Uh, in fact, the with a resident, so resident doctors, uh, you know, doctors in training and medical students come through my office all the time. Remember, I'm at Duke University. I'm an associate professor of medicine. I'm past president of the Obesity Medicine Association. I deal with lifestyle, though, not medication or surgery. But one of the patients came through saying, you know, it hurts when I eat plants. And I, I was I looked at the residents that we just were talking about this outside the room. And I said, well, try going without the food that makes you hurt. You know, and, and, you know, that brings me to kind of the, I know it's, it's called, you know, face validity, common, common sense, or, or just one of the aha moments when someone that was explaining to me like the fifth time plants can't run away. Their, their only defense mechanism against mammals, really, is to put stuff in their leaves that make the mammals sick. 
so that they don't come back and eat the leaves. And I'm thinking, it can't be that, can't be that simple. But when you look in the leaves, you know, this is called plants and, and vegetables, uh, uh, there, there are toxins. And, and there, some people will be more affected by them than others. So it's it, that kind of, uh, now I, I need science, I need prospective data and collect it in, in a good form. And the uh, carnivore world is doing that slowly. You know, so if you've uh, participated in a survey, fantastic. I mean, so there are more surveys coming around, getting your labs drawn and, and having people look at them. Uh, but uh, I don't see any danger. It, it might even be very helpful for medical things, medical problems. Yep. That's why we're seeing so many people reverse so many diseases when they've tried everything else, just from taking out something, not adding in something. It's absolutely incredible. One problem though, is that if people have kidney problems, existing kidney problems, red meat will make that worse. Yeah. I, I think that's a myth. That's not, not true. The, the old issue about protein and the kidneys goes way back to when they were measuring something called the GFR or glomerular filtration rate in, in a, directly, the, that there was more flow through the kidney if you gave more protein. And, and there's this kind of irrational, but it kind of makes sense that if you have protein in the urine, protein in the food will lead to the protein in the urine. That's not true. It's a, it's a problem in the kidney that leaks the protein, usually diabetes, that affects that. So no, and in fact, one of the professors here at Duke surveyed as best they could the people who came through my clinic who had kidney problems and published a paper on it. And we didn't have a lot of people with really bad kidney disease, but we had some. And the good news is that being on a diet that was full of protein, very low on carbs, did not worsen. Now, it, it didn't make everyone miraculously get better, but it didn't worsen the kidney disease. And, I, you know, in my experience, I've had, I've had some people go from, from the very poor kidney function onto dialysis, like this the usual, the usual progression. So I, I can't say that it miraculously fixes everyone, but if you have diabetes that's causing the kidney trouble and you reverse the diabetes, this type one or type two, if you improve the, the blood sugar, control, it's possible that you can improve the kidney function actually by reversing the diabetes by eating red meat. So again, it's in, in the context of what, el what el other things do you eat? And a lot of the research with nutritional epidemiology is eating red meat in the context of eating carbohydrates too. That would be another way to just say it's like comparing apples and oranges. The research that's being done is among those who eat carbohydrates. An interesting, interesting point is that, you know, if you're doing a carnivore diet, you are doing a low carbohydrate diet. In some people's minds, it might, you know, oh, here's carnivore, here's low carb. And, and no, you're, you're eating a low carb diet. And, and so you want to pay attention to research or, or the information that comes from low carbohydrate lifestyles, not the high carb ones. So that's so interesting that you say that, that carnivore is a piece of the low carb spectrum. So if you have research in low carb, it is attributable to a carnivore diet. I actually didn't think about that. I was just thinking no carb, low carb, high carb. Well, of course, the low carb 30% of, car of diet is carbohydrate is not anything near a carnivore. Uh, but I, I low carb can mean under 50, under 20 carbs, total carbs per day or, or zero carbs. Uh, so that interestingly, so when I teach, I don't in, enforce that every day you must have greens. You know, I say that you can have up to this amount. And so practically speaking, most people, someday they'll have a salad, someday they won't. Someday, so the, the again, the, the approach that I learned and that I teach is pretty flexible in terms of when you eat and, and what you eat and although the gram limit is firm. So you're under the 20, 30, 50 sort of total gram per day. Carnivore would be almost zero. Okay, next one. If you have gout, red meat will make it worse. 
Um, in the context of eating carbohydrates, yeah. And the so that's what all the doctors know. And it's certainly the, uh, but if you're outside of the, the carbohydrate eating world, no, the red meat won't cause gout. Although initially, as I transition someone from a high carb to a low carb diet, if you do have ketosis, you can measure this with breath, blood, or urine. I don't recommend that people measure it, but you can. You might get a gout flare right at the beginning as you transition. So most doctors will see that and say, oh, gout flare, don't do that. Now, you, what you want to do is get over the gout flare, get treated. And this is with people who have a history of gout. Uh, so that uh, if, this, if you've never had gout, don't worry about it. it that mm -hmm. won't happen. So the metabolic syndrome, which is from the carbohydrates, is actually what's going on behind the scenes to cause the, the um, tendency toward gout. And, and early on, I suppose, uh, I did have someone in the years uh, that I recall who went out and had really high purine meats. I think it was, it was like had, a, you know, 20 oysters or something, and, and that caused the gout flare. So there still are situations that you want to, if you have gout, you've been taught to minimize certain foods. At the beginning, I would have you continue those restrictions, but then let's say you're down uh, 20, 30, 50 pounds, the underlying metabolic syndrome is fixed, the red meat stop causing gout. Oh, okay. Because I had somebody on my carnival group said, I'm doing carnival and I have gout, but it could be because he was on a high carbohydrate diet, already had existing gout, and that transitional effect, it's just not going to go away if just doing carnival for three months. You have to give it time. Right. So the, the, a good um, proxy or a good way to estimate the metabolic syndrome, that underlying cause of gout, is the weight. So if someone has more weight to lose, and in, in my clinical setting, I have some people who need to lose 200 pounds. So until so it's not a matter of the time, it's a matter of the, the progress. And then once you're down to a much better weight, then you're not going to have the same metabolic issues like diabetes, like gout, like hypertension even gets better. So all of those medical things uh, have an initial improvement with changing the diet. But if there's underlying obesity, those things can linger in a, in a uh, less uh, severe form, though. Okay. Everything that you say, you explain it so well, so it just makes so much sense. I'm sure that your patients love you. Like, your personality is so kind and nice. Well, you know, I hope everyone loves their doctor. I hope, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, well, you know, I want to just say that um, in, there was a book some years ago called The Tipping Point which uh, came out when we were starting to do research in this area. And, and the, the, you needed people who were like the, the, the uh, experts in the, the knowledge. And then you needed salespeople and you needed connectors. And that was kind of like the, 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 the magic formula for something that you know, takes off. And I realized that I'm a connector so that so that I was able to go into research and, and medical conferences, all this to connect the dots for people and all this. And, and in the clinic setting, what, what we see now are a lot of the salesmen. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's the, the people who now are selling, the, 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 are using low carb and carnivore information. And ones get very popular. You might have influencers who didn't do any of the science. It's fine. You know, the, so what we were able to do is connect enough people together. I have to say, I, I'm I'm not the one who holds that knowledge. the 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 super, uh, uh, I think they call him Maven in that in that book. The these this is Steve Finney. This is Je Jeff Volick. These are the scientists who are who are doing active research now on the the mechanisms of low carb and keto diets, and then. Uh, people you may be interviewing have or book authors or influencers in the carnivore space. This is great. I mean, we we need hundreds of them. We, you know, I want every doctor. I want you to see your doctor and the doctor to be okay with this. You know, even uh, uh, if you're a doctor watching, 
just have a have a book, a couple of books on the shelf and say, you know, you might want to look into this this book. And, and a certain percentage of people will go out and do what you say, doctors. Uh, <laughs> the, doc, but the doctors sometimes are frustrated because what they teach doesn't work. And so people come back saying, well, you know, what you taught me well, didn't really work. Or it, what, what's happening is they're the problem isn't going away. They're being managed. And, and so a lot of doctors come to that organization I was president of, the Obesity Medicine Association, because they're looking for new ways to help their patients. And lifestyle like this is so powerful that, again, the, the, I guess the only danger is if you're on a medicine that might become too strong. That And, and then that's not fair because it's not the diet that's dangerous. It's the medication. Another thing that might not be the diet is eating too much meat will cause constipation, which will lead to colon cancer. Yeah, again, that's uh, just, uh, let, let me take the one at a time. Um, the amount of stool that you have, bowel movements and flow, it changes. I mean, you, it's a function of what you eat and the amount of bowel gas and bowel just stool that you have goes down because you're more efficient. So how often you go to have a poop doesn't matter. It, it, if the stools are hard or hard to pass, this might be a transitional thing, but over time your body will get used to it. And uh, uh, sure, occasionally I ask people to use uh, magnesium supplementation to help with the stools or, or these days, doctors prescribe these stool softeners and things. Sure, if you need to use that for a while, uh, but how often you go doesn't matter. And uh, the colon cancer issue is, is one of the, again, it's kind of made sense, you know, well, if you don't poop as often, you have toxins in there and all. Well, there was finally a big study where they randomized people to fiber or no fiber for colon cancer, and it didn't reduce it. It didn't didn't work, so and there, there and yet that kind of uh, uh, idea that myth is perpetuated, uh, and uh, the GI doctors we joke, you know, all they know is you need more fiber, when when no, most GI issues get better by cutting carbohydrates out. I reacted to a video on my channel recently to a, a gentleman who had an ileostomy. Uh, I said colostomy and someone corrected me. It was an ileostomy. Fine. You know, so it was the, most people know it a colost. Anyway, again, I, I tried to communicate uh, to people and may not be totally perfect in, in my language. But anyway, he, he said he never sees meat come out of his, his ileostomy. It, it, he never sees a piece of meat. He digests it all. And, and yet if he has corn or, or celery or something, it comes out undigested in his, because he, his stool comes out in a bag called an ileostomy. And, and he's talking about this. It's a, it's a great video. And, and the issue that he was, he had his colon removed. The issue was ulcerative colitis. And he tells us about that story. He didn't know about the diet before that having that. And, in the comments below, I mean, there, there are a dozen people who say my ulcerative colitis went away too. My ulcer so what's fascinating is uh, now I can't believe everything that's written below a video, right? There might be people, there might be trolls, there, there might be people falsely claiming things that are, are better, but that's a strong signal. There's a, a medical student at Harvard who fixed his own ulcerative colitis by going on a low carb keto diet. And the reason I say this is most GI doctors are clueless. Well, because now there are medicines that are so strong, they take away the symptoms of the ulcerative colitis, but the underlying role or, or cause is still there. So again, it, it's a, this is a, you know, I think of this as an alternative therapeutic pathway rather than medications. You're using a lifestyle and a very powerful lifestyle at that. Don't worry about how often you poop. <laughs> okay. Two more dangers. 
Meat does not provide a diverse microbiome, and therefore we need plants for a diverse microbiome. <laughs> well, uh, again, um, while true, it might not be necessary. So I'll never forget being at a international meeting where the world's expert on the micro microbiome got up. World expert. And he said, here, like a tropical rainforest is the microbiome with all the bacteria and someone who eats carbohydrates. Look how great and beautiful it is. And I'm thinking, tropical rainforest, they're frogs that can kill you, right? I mean, there's snakes, you know, all, you know but but the, the, the mindset is here is normal, right? Here's how beautiful. And then click, here's a low carb. It wasn't keto, but it was lower carb. And it looked kind of like a desert. And he used the desert as the, the picture. You know, there aren't as many, it's not as diverse and, and, you know, and must be bad was his connotation, you know? Well, I knew I was going to speak in uh, Arizona the, within a few weeks. And I thought in my mind, okay, I'm going to bring this up. And I'm going to say in front of in about 350 people on a Saturday morning in Arizona, I said, and this guy insinuated that the desert isn't beautiful. And they all go, no, it is beautiful. The, the cactus and the flowers and the colors. And the so, yes, it's different. To me, having, you know, a serene place to look without tropical rainforest bacteria, it may actually be calming to have less microbacteria the microbiome. And so Amy Berger, who helped me write the, my book, latest book, my solo book, End Your Carb Confusion. We really wrote it together. She's an author. Uh, End Your Carb Confusion. Great book. There's a companion cookbook too. We would look at each other and go, no, not the microbiome again. Well, see, you can get funding to fund. You can get a study on the microbiome and, and they're Every university, there, there's a place here at Duke where you can send poop and they look at all of the, the bacteria and all this. And, and my goodness. So we've never talked about the gut microbiome for the last 25 years and it works just fine. So now if you want to eat carbs, you might want to be concerned about the microbiome and start adding probiotics and all these different things. But if you don't eat carbs your gut's going to be just fine. It might even be less gurgly, uh, less bacteria in there chomping on the carbs to make gas. So, I, you know, remember I'm a doctor. I talk about poop and, and all that in my clinic. The flatulence is like my carb detector, personally. I mean, I, if I, oh, ooh, I had a little carbohydrate yesterday <laughs> and because... Uh, it, the the gut irritable bowel syndrome gone reflux heartburn uh, gone uh, the uh, uh, I, anyway the, the not the not the microbiome next one this is the last one okay so I saw on a, your YouTube video um, you did a react video to Chris Cresser who calls the carnivore diet a fad diet merely mimics a fed fasting state. <laughs> well, so that's interesting. So it is fed fasting. Well, so fasting is a situation, uh, technically, I guess, when you're not eating anything for a long period of time, you might have a water fast. If you eat once a day, people are calling that intermittent fasting. And uh, so the fasting really, though, to me means fat burning means nutritional ketosis. So if you watch these reality TV shows, they're out there in the middle of nowhere, they're not eating anything. They're munching on their body fat and they're in nutritional ketosis that keeps them alive. And, and so the fasting ketosis, nutritional ketosis to me is the same thing. And fed fasting, which is eating proteins that don't turn off protein and fat, that don't turn off the fat burning, is an adequate, it, it's a correct way of saying what's going on, fed fasting. Now, that it's a fad diet, the fad, fad diets don't come back. 
they they come and they go. So <laughs> this kind of approach has never gone away. It keeps coming back. And the mainstream people call it fad, fad diet just so that they can sell their products and get people to follow what they're doing. The to me, the fad diet is the the processed food diet that was promoted as low fat diets over the last 40 years and it's caused a disaster in terms of health so i'm you know we're weathering this storm of the fad diet of of you know cereal and sugar and and, all, and you know it's going to take a while if we go away or or those who are sensitive to it and have medical issues have to become aware of that and just avoid it you know uh, but it, it's taken a long time Thirty or forty years for smoking to go down from about thirty-five percent of Americans now to about ten percent or thirteen, something like that. Uh, so it's going to take time, you know, a, a generation for people to wake up to this. But no, the fad diet is the carb eating diet to me, it, and and highly processed carbs uh, that you see in the middle of your grocery store and. Uh, sadly, I, I think the, the companies want to push toward those foods because they're more profitable. And and so if you're going toward corporate profit, then you're going to push people away from the real food, the, the food on the outside of the grocery store, because it doesn't have as high uh, a markup and profitability. But I wanted to ask them now about something that I'm hearing, and I think you did a Reacts video about this as well, which is having low insulin all the time is dangerous. You actually want your insulin to go up and down and that's why you need fruit and honey because that's what is needed for your body to perform better. Have you heard that? Well, it is sort of a popular thing going around these days. And, you know, with something like this, I said, well, where's your evidence for that? But it's not based on any science. Again, it's kind of the best I can tell it. People who got into the keto carnivore space because it was oh trendy, fashionable, mar you know profitable, not based in science, are are going to be pushed back toward the mainstream eventually because you know. And so what I it's, it's what I'm sensing that's happening is some influencers because they didn't have the scientific grounding. They, they got into it, especially in the keto world during the COVID era. There were a lot of, wow, crazy, you know, uh, non-scientific things because it was fashionable. And so if you got into keto because not, you know, for, for science and for human health, you're going to feel like you're out, uh, out on, on a limb and be, you know, well, you know, most people do have a rise of insulin and, and if I don't, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, it, so it seems to me uh, either uh, because of fear of the unknown or, or these people are, are wanting to maybe um, sensing that the keto community is, is too niche and going down. So you want to broaden your, your appeal to, I, I see that in some companies that are, are it's ones that are growing, they want to, you know, add in more carbs so that more people will follow them because, you know, carbs are hard to give up for a lot of people. So I don't think the insulin rise after a meal to the extent that carbohydrates make is necessary. There's no evidence for that. Protein causes a small rise in insulin. In fact, one of the jobs of insulin, I think probably its primary job is to help amino acids get into the cells. It, it, I think that when you kind of step back to look at the hunter-gatherer, paleo, primal sort of historical diets that people had, there were not many carbs. And the idea of having having to have an insulin spike. Uh, oh, some people then argue, well, if you keep that insulin you know, fight in fighting mode, then when you have a glucose tolerance test of 75 grams of glucose, it won't go sky high. Your insulin will be able to, well, Ben Bickman has done some research on that. Just give it a couple days of carbs and your pancreas will respond 
back again and get in and to be able to fight that glucose spike. I mean, so uh, it, it, that's a hard, um, hard statement to prove uh, to say that you need or it's better to have an insulin spike. What I see is the keeping the glucose and insulin as low as you can has a lot of health benefits. Well, the other kind of thing is, <laughs> oh, it, why? what are you trying to accomplish? So if you're trying to be a reverse diabetes, uh, reverse obesity, uh, th that's one way to use keto. If you're trying to maximize your physical performance in the gym, you've never had insulin resistance in your life, you're going to get influencers who teach based on that as your goal. So be careful when you're hearing things. What is this person trying to do with the low carb keto or carnivore diet? And there may be other circumstances if you're bodybuilding, for example, where you do want to have carbs and they've figured it out in their own bodies. That that's different. That so I'm I'm speaking more from the medical use, therapeutic use and, and general healthiness not trying to optimize your physical performance, you know, win the Olympics or anything, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Most people are not trying to win the Olympics. They're just trying to reverse their diabetes. And it's interesting, like when you hear in, in the presence of a healthy metabolic body, well, most people don't have a healthy metabolic body. So how can you introduce, you know, carbohydrates, fruit and honey? Like most people don't. So the people that you're talking to is the minority. Well, uh, uh, it, it, the way I kind of address this in, in our approach and in, in our book and your carb confusion is I have different levels. And so uh, I don't know that being under 20 or, or zero carb is going to be better for everyone. And, and we're at a, again, trying to meet people where they are. And if I can get someone at least to, a, you know, 100 grams of carbs a day, that's going to be better than 350. If I can get them to 50 and then they 50 grams and they're starting to reverse medical issues, that's that's fantastic. So so the way we addressed it is we don't know yet which is best. So let's offer all as possibility. I wanted to let you know the next carnival challenge is now open. Every week we have expert carnival doctors and carnival coaches to help guide you along your journey. And what I thought was really important was to have carnival doctors coming on every week because I know when you go see your doctor, they're going to talk about red meat causing heart attacks, stroke and cancer. And that's why having these doctors on board to help you is so important. So if you'd like to join the next challenge, there is a clickable link in the description of this video or just head to academy.5minutebody.com. Dr. Westman, how can people find you? Well, my company, Adapt Your Life, is, has a YouTube channel. Adapt Your Life uh, is free information. Uh, Adapt Your Life Academy is my company where we teach people who can't make it their way to the Duke Clinic. So we have courses that are available at adaptyourlifeacademy.com. If you really want to just kind of browse among lots of things, and ericwestmanmd.com as a list of foods you can get, a, a link to the book that I talked about, End Your Carb Confusion, and a link to the Adapt Your Life Academy. So ericwestmanmd.com is another source. And But we try to give free information. And then for those who can't get to Duke, teach people uh, on the internet too. Well, I'm going to leave all the links in the show notes of this video so you can check out Dr. Eric Westman because the work he's doing is truly incredible. But Dr. Westman, Thank you so much. You're a pleasure and a joy, and I'm sure that we're going to see you very soon. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Now you need to watch this video next with Dr. Sean O'Mara. He'll talk about the best way to lose your belly fat and the visceral fat, and it's not just eating meat. I'll see you guys next week.